Joyce Meyer Ministries dankt haar donateurs die deze uitzending mogelijk maakten. You receive mercy from God, now you have peace with God, you have peace with yourself. You give mercy to other people, now you can have your peace back. Because here's the bottom line, you're not going to stand before God for them. If you're mad at yourself, why don't you just get over it and receive some mercy today? No matter what God wants to give you, if you won't receive it, for you it's as if he never gave it. Receive mercy. You don't deserve it. Receive it. You should be slapped upside the head, but receive mercy. <laughs> you should never get a prayer answered again, but receive mercy and come boldly to the throne. Amen? I know I don't have a right to anything. I don't have a right to do this. Why me? I don't have a right to be blessed. I don't have a right to be forgiven. But I'll tell you one thing. I understand the program. And if God's given it, I'm taking it. You don't got to talk me into nothing, God. Here I am. I'm a spiritual hog. Gimme, give gimme, give gimme, give gimme, gimme. Not greedy. But I'll take everything that God wants to give me. Matthew 12. See, if you'll receive God's mercy, then you can have peace with God. Verse 1, at that particular time, Jesus went through the fields of standing grain on the Sabbath, and his disciples were hungry, and they began to pick off the grain and eat it. Now, it was illegal to do that on the Sabbath. Jesus is breaking the law. Uh-oh. And the Pharisees are always there watching, and sure enough, they were there that day, and they saw it. You better believe if you make one mistake, there will be some religious devil hanging around in your airspace. <laughs> to say, uh-huh. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said to him, Now you see there, your disciples are doing what is unlawful and not permitted on the Sabbath. Na 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 na, we caught you. <laughs> and Jesus said to them, Have you not ever read what David did when he was hungry? And those who accompanied him, what they did? How he went into the house of God and ate the loaves of showbread, which was not lawful for him to eat? nor for the men who accompanied him. Nobody was supposed to eat those loaves of bread that were left on the altar because they represented the presence of God. And it was illegal for them to eat them. But David and his men were hungry. They were out in battle and they were hungry. And somehow or another he had the audacity to believe that his need overrode the law. <laughs> yeah, you too religious to get that that early, right? That's the way I was when God started trying to teach me this scripture. You know, it was one of those defining moments in my life where every time I opened the Bible, it was Matthew 12. And I was just like, all right already, will you tell me what you're trying to get across to me? You ever have that where you just keep getting the same thing? I mean, it's on the radio, it's on TV, it comes in the mail, it's like, and you're just not getting it. It's like, well, I was so legalistic and had such a Pharisee spirit. And you know, if you're legalistic with yourself, you're going to be legalistic with everybody else. My father was legalistic with me, and I just entered my relationship with God like that. I was very hard on myself. I was very demanding of myself. And I was that same way with, with other people. And God was trying to break that out of me. He was trying to get me to understand mercy, how to receive mercy, and how to give mercy. And yes, we have the law, if you will, which is now written in our heart. We have the guidelines. And so the law says, if you sin, you shall be punished. 
But Jesus said, we now have a new covenant. And when you sin, if you ask me to forgive you and come boldly to my throne, I will meet your need even though you don't deserve it. So David really shouldn't have went in there and eaten that bread, but he knew that the heart of God would understand that he and his men were starving and they couldn't continue in battle if they didn't eat. When Jesus was picking the grain on the Sabbath, he already knew that the Pharisees were watching him. He did it on purpose. He did it on purpose to stir them up. And I'll tell you what, he loves to aggravate religious people. Yeah. Verse 6, I tell you something greater and more exalted and more majestic than the temple is here. Verse 7, and if you had only known what this saying means, I desire mercy, readiness to help, to spare, and to forgive, rather than sacrifice and sacrificial victims. When people do something wrong, don't try to make them pay. Leave that up to God. You have a merciful attitude toward them. Now, I'm not saying that you should always remove the penalty of what someone has done. I'm talking to you about attitude. I'm talking to you about the attitude that you have toward them. And the whole reason why we get into trouble with all this judging everybody else is because we don't understand the difference. Yes, we are going to judge sin. The more you learn about God and about the Word of God, the quicker you're going to recognize sin in your own life and in other people's. When the Bible says don't judge, it doesn't mean don't recognize and deal with sin. But it does mean don't judge the person. I can see what you did, but I don't know what's in your heart. I can see what you did, but I don't know what you've gone through in your life that maybe has got you all messed up and that's why you're behaving the way you're behaving. Come on. I can see how you're acting, but I don't know what's happened to you that's making you act that way. See, God sees the why behind the what, and that's the nature of mercy. Mercy doesn't just judge what it sees, but it goes deeper than that, and it, it says to God, show me your heart, show me what you would do in this situation. Is anybody understanding me today? You receive mercy from God, now you have peace with God, you have peace with yourself. You give mercy to other people, now you can have your peace back. Because here's the bottom line, you're not going to stand before God for them. We just worry too much about what other people are doing. Why don't you pray for them and leave it to God? We get way too involved in other people's business. Tell yourself 10 times a day it's none of your business. It's none of your business. <laughs> Amen? Don't have an opinion where you don't have responsibility. Well, I don't think what I don't think what I don't think what I don't think. <laughs> If you sow judgment, you'll reap judgment. We don't like it when people judge us, so we need to not sow judgment. Once again, I can see if what you're doing is wrong, but I can't see your heart. I don't know why you're doing it. There's a difference in judging what a person's doing and judging them. Do you understand that? Okay. So as God continued to give me Matthew, Matthew 12, these first verses, go and learn mercy, learn what this means. I want you to learn mercy. I want you to learn to help, to spare, to forgive, rather than requiring sacrifice out of people. He gave me an example that was quite profound for me. And it was regarding a child that we had that was 12 at the time. And he just was one of these kids that didn't follow the rules very good. He wasn't a rule-oriented child. He was more of a free spirit. And uh, so we were desperately trying to teach him to clean his room, 
Do the few things that we'd ask him to do. Have some discipline in your life. You can't just go by your feelings all the time. So we finally tacked a list of rules on his door. Make your bed, take the trash out, clean up after the dog, da 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 Now, many times he'd be outside playing and the neighborhood bully would take his ball away from him and throw it down the sewer. There was one guy in the neighborhood that just delighted in tormenting him. And I can remember when he would come running into the garage screaming at the top of his lungs, Daddy! It's about the way we sound when we get in trouble and we cry out to God. <laughs> and God reminded me, he said, now what kind of parent would you be when you heard your child screaming for help? If you slowly got up off the couch and said to Dave, let me run downstairs first and check his list. <laughs> See if he got all of his check marks today and if he did, then you can go help him. But if he does not have his check marks, serves him right. <laughs> well, no, of course we didn't behave like that. I mean, I've seen Dave practically tear the furniture up and tear the door off the hinges getting out there to help his boy. <laughs> now, that doesn't mean we wouldn't deal with him about not doing his chores. But dealing with him about what he did or didn't do did not keep us from showing him love, grace, and mercy when he needed help. So guess what? Maybe you don't have everything checked off your list. Maybe you didn't get all your check marks and your stars. I used to be on this Bible reading program, and if you read six chapters a day, you got a check mark. We love check marks. I felt really good when I had my check marks. And then when I had these gaping holes, it would condemn me. <laughs> but God's not looking at our check marks. He's looking at our heart. Receive God's mercy and be merciful. Let's go to Hebrews 5, 1 and 2. Who does God choose to use? And why does he choose the kind of people he chooses? <laughs> The weak and the foolish things of the world. Isn't it rather humorous, the people that God uses? <laughs> Martin saying this morning that he failed music? A world-renowned worship leader and he failed music? Well, I didn't fail English, but I got a D. I never could get the verbs and the nouns and the pronouns and all. I didn't care. I just wanted to talk. <laughs> didn't really matter to me what it was. Look at this, Hebrews 5, 1. For every high priest chosen from among men is appointed to act on behalf of men in things relating to God to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. Now, oh, this is so beautiful. Verse 2. He is able to exercise gentleness and forbearance toward the ignorant and the erring since he himself also is liable to moral weakness and physical infirmity. <laughs> Why does God pick messed up people? Because they can have mercy on other messed up people. <laughs> you see, I get you, I understand. Amen? Amen? Paul, why, why, did, why did God choose Paul, a man who was persecuting Christians? <laughs> because he wanted to show his mercy and grace. And what did Paul teach on? He brought the revelation of grace to the church because he had experienced the grace and the mercy and the kindness of God. I wonder what a modern-day management firm would have said to Jesus about the people he chose. Suppose he submitted their resumes to the Jordan Management Consultant Firm in Jerusalem. These are the 12 men I've chosen. I'd like you to look over their resumes and tell me what you think. 
And now they answer, well, it's the staff opinion that most of your nominees are lacking in background education and vocational aptitude for the type of enterprise you're undertaking. My goodness, Jesus, if you want to spread this message to the whole world, you better get a few people that know what they're doing. <laughs> they do not have a team concept at all. <laughs> we highly recommend that you continue your search for persons of experience and managerial ability and proven capability. Simon Peter is emotionally unstable <laughs> and given to fits of temper. Andrew has absolutely no qualities of leadership. The two brothers, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, place personal interest above company loyalty. Thomas dip demonstrates a questioning attitude that will definitely undermine morale on your team. <laughs> we feel that it is our duty to tell you that Matthew has been blacklisted by the Greater Jerusalem Better Business Bureau. <laughs> James, the son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, definitely have radical leanings and they both register a high score on the manic depressive scale. <laughs> there was actually only one applicant that the consultant firm approved of and that was Judas. God uses the weak and the foolish of the world to confound the wise. And the bigger mess you've been, the greater minister you can be. It's good for you occasionally to mess up. It keeps you understanding what real people go through. I absolutely just don't do well at all with preachers who only tell you their successes. Please do not tell me your testimony if you are not going to tell me the truth about how you got there. Because all that does is I hear your victory and then I think, what in the world is wrong with me? Come on. Have a little humility. Share your faults. Share your weaknesses. Let people into your life. Open up your life to them. Be real. Amen. Amen. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Mercy is greater than judgment. We should not be judging other people. And to be honest, we should not be concerned about other people's judgment of us. Come on now. Everybody's got an opinion about everything. And I can tell you, people that are not successful always find fault with successful people. <laughs> people who don't have anything usually find fault with the people who do. If you have a nice car, somebody who has a nice car won't judge you. But if you have a nice car, and somebody you know doesn't have one, then they're probably going to decide that you shouldn't have one either. <laughs> Come on. First Peter 3. To you and through you, receive God's mercy, be merciful to other people. Be at peace with God, and then you can be at peace with other people. Jesus could only speak peace to the storm because he had peace in him. You cannot give away what you don't have. Amen. There's certain scriptures in the Bible that have been extremely important to me. And this one in 1 Peter 3, two scriptures actually were two of the ones that were very important. Let him who wants to enjoy life and see good days, good whether apparent or not, 1 Peter 3.10. Let him who wants to enjoy life and see good days, good whether apparent or not, <clears throat> let him keep his tongue free from evil and his lips from guile. Now our emotions, if they're not controlled, is what will get us upset. But it's our words and our thoughts that control our emotions. So if you ever want to have peace, you got to do something about your mouth.
If something's going on you don't like, the more you complain about it, the more upset you get. <laughs> Come on now. Let him turn away from wickedness, verse 11, and shun it and let him do right. Let him search for peace. Peace is not going to fall on you like ripe cherries falling off a tree. You've got to go after it. You've got to search for peace, harmony, undisturbedness from fears, agitating passions, and moral conflicts, and seek it eagerly. Now watch this. Do not merely desire peaceful relations with God, with your fellow man, and with yourself, but pursue and go after them. I can almost promise you, if you are not enjoying the peace in your life that you know you should be enjoying, you are not going to have it unless you make some changes. I don't care how much you pray for it, you got to make some changes. Now go to Romans 12, and we'll finish up today there. When I finally got to the point where I said, God, I, I just can't, I, I've got to have peace. I hope there's some of you here today that are at that point. It's like, I can't live mad. I can't live upset. I'm tired of stress. I'm tired of arguing and strife. And I can't live like this anymore. I'm tired of feeling guilty and condemned. I'm tired of trying to be perfect and always fouling up and then having to feel guilty. I want peace with you. I want peace with myself. You have to accept yourself. You have to come to the point where you say, it is what it is. And I'm going to do the best I can with it. I'm going to get up every day and try to make progress. But God knew what he was getting when he got me. He's not surprised today <laughs> at what he ended up with. Amen? Come on, he knows the end from the beginning and everything in between. Psalm 139 says that he knows words that we have not yet uttered that are in our mouth. So God knows us. He accepts us unconditionally. You have to accept yourself. Make peace with your thighs. If you don't like them, make peace with them. on. Make peace with how tall you are or how short you are or whatever the case might be. Make peace with yourself. As you've heard me say, you know, I didn't like my voice. I wanted a nice little soft, sweet, girly sounding voice. I called a spa recently to make an appointment for a facial and they asked me if I had a beard. They said, do you have any facial hair? Well, I wasn't where this lady was at. I'm thinking, well, yeah, I got eyebrows and eyelashes. That's what I'm thinking. And then I thought, well, I got a little peach. But, and I said, well, yeah, I mean, you know, I said, I got eyebrows and eyelashes. And she said, no, no, I mean, do you have a beard or a goatee? <laughs> and you know what? I got the biggest kick out of that. I've had more laughs over that. The whole country's laughing about that. You know, if we can just see things from God's viewpoint. Now, there would have been a day when that would have just did me in. But when you know who you are, it doesn't really matter that much what people think. <laughs> Come on. Make peace with yourself. Be at peace with God and make a decision that you are going to find a way to get along with people. <laughs> and now, don't miss this. It won't come because you are successful at changing them. Yes, I will have peace with you as soon as you change. 
Well, there is a remote possibility that God is trying to use them to change you. Woo! Glory. Well, all throughout God's Word, He demonstrates His love for us, and He does it through showing us mercy. Now, you know, mercy is not the result of our own goodness, but it's the result of God's goodness. It's His unmerited, unearned favor. When we imitate God's mercy to others, we are providing for them an example of God's love, and it also brings peace and joy into our own lives. Anytime that we're treating other people the way that God instructs us to treat them, we're going to experience joy ourselves. And I know a lot of times we hear love and we love everything, you know, and then sometimes we don't love anything. But we have to understand that love is not a feeling. It's a decision that we make about how we're going to treat people. Could you please listen to that seriously? Love is not a feeling. It's a decision that we make about how we're going to treat people. Mm -hmm.